But thank you so much for having me here. It is such an honor and pleasure to spend the next few minutes telling you a story. And it's a story that spans more than two decades of a condition that continues to fascinate me to this day, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEM. So, well, let's start in the 2000s. What were you doing? Really think back a little between your munches. Well, the younger me, I suppose, was grateful that the world didn't end with Y2K. I love Destiny's Child. So glad that hip hop was in because I was listening to it in my cool iPod. First introduced in, by Apple in 2001. But at the same time, I was packing that as well as the Blackberry. Hands up those who've also touch one of those. And I was leaving my tropical island city of Singapore for the refrigerated state of Rochester, Minnesota. And that was to work with my first ever female mentor, Dr. Margaret Redfield. As you can see, this strapping young man was also someone that I met in those early days and plays a huge role in why I really, really got into heart failure as a subspecialty. But why leave a tropical island for this, this truly cold state? I mean, I am actually standing on a frozen lake in that picture. Well, that's because there was rumored to be a form of heart failure that encompassed at least a third and increasing to half the heart failure population that we were seeing, and that was even increasing relative to so-called systolic heart failure. Now, this was at least as reported in Olmsted County, Minnesota, whereas in Singapore, and even in the current guidelines at that time, there was widespread skepticism that this condition even existed. You see, look at the ESC guidelines in 2001. The definition of heart failure, very simple. There's no ejection fraction even mentioned there. And under a little paragraph on heart failure due to diastolic dysfunction, there was a lot of mention of debate, uncertainty, and a lack of evidence. Still, why did we call it heart failure due to diastolic dysfunction or diastolic heart failure? Well, it was because there were landmark papers such as this from Dr. Michael Zeil, one of the first to really show that in this left ventricular pressure volume relationship, compared to healthy young controls, patients with so-called diastolic heart failure had an end diastolic pressure volume relationship that was shifted leftward and upward so that at any given filling volume, filling pressure was raised. So that is diastolic dysfunction. However, please note that in this beautiful study, the diastolic heart failure cases were majority men and middle-aged. And that was quite unlike the epidemiologic studies we were hearing at the same time that this was a condition of hypertensive older women predominantly. And so that gave me room to look at this in a population-based, more unselected approach in Olmsted County. And what we found was indeed, the majority of patients in this study were elderly hypertensive women with heart failure. But we also showed after age, sex, and body size correction that compared to controls in green, patients with hypertensive heart disease, but with no heart failure as well, another control, those with diastolic heart failure in red indeed had diastolic dysfunction, leftward, upward shifted, and diastolic pressure volume relationship. But there's more. You see, we also decided to characterize the end systolic pressure volume relationship. And as you can see in red, it is also steeper compared to both controls. So there's systolic stiffening. There's also enlargement of the left atrium, increase in the end diastolic pressure, natriuretic peptides are increased, 
And then if you go even more upstream, guess what? Even the pulmonary pressures are increased. And in fact, the prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in these patients is more than 80%. So how does this all come into a picture? Well, it's still pretty neat so far. So what we have is diastolic dysfunction. There's increased left ventricular filling pressure leading to left atrial hypertension. The hypertension gets reflected backwards into the pulmonary circulation. So there's pulmonary venous followed by pulmonary arterial hypertension. Nice and neat, but unfortunately there's a glitch. And that's because in Olmsted County at the same time, Dr. Redfield showed that there is diastolic dysfunction even if you don't have heart failure. And this is especially in elderly persons in the community and patients with systolic heart failure have even more diastolic dysfunction. So diastolic dysfunction is neither sufficient nor specific for diastolic heart failure. And so that's why we decided, okay, maybe we should move away from this name of diastolic heart failure, implying that it's only because of diastolic dysfunction. And why don't we name it something that focuses on its normal systolic function? But the question is, is systolic function normal? So this entered many papers during that period. You can go look it up. And it offered me a bit more room to do a bit more clinical research. So we decided let's look at systolic function using mid-wall fractional shortening by echo in these patients. And we found that stress-corrected mid-wall fractional shortening or a measure of contractility was actually reduced in hepnef compared to the other controls. So despite a preservation of global ejection fraction, at the myocardial level, there is contractile dysfunction. And you know what? Strain studies now show that and so on. But what it says is, I don't think we can use this term because systolic function is not normal in at least some of these patients. And hence came this term, kind of non-committal really, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or HEPPEP. Now this was originally coined in charm preserve. It's almost an exclusionary name to refer to patients who did not have frankly reduced ejection fraction. So it actually referred to heart failure with anything more than 40% of an EF. Okay, so I'm gonna go with that flow and use that term for now, knowing that now it's got split even further, but let's carry on because the nice thing is this prediction that HEFPEF would become the dominant form of heart failure. As you can see that last year is 2020 turned out to be absolutely true. And thank goodness, because there's lots of skepticism from where I came from. And so in the 2010s, what were you doing? All right, I do confess, I was into Gangnam Style and all those of you laughing were also obviously into it as well, but I was also digging the new guidelines because look here now, Diagnosis of heart failure has HEFREF and HEFPEP, which to this day looks a bit simplified because now, as you, you may know, we've got more kinds <laughs> than just these two. But in the 2012 guidelines, it still said no treatment has yet been shown convincingly to reduce morbidity and mortality in these patients. Now, it was not for want of trying. And what we did initially is apply all the therapies that had been proven in HEF-REF and just tried to extrapolate it to HEF-PEF. And these were things like, as you see, I-Preserve, PEP, CHF, Charm Preserve, these were ARBs. Seniors was beta blocker, DIG was of course digoxin. And as you can see, all the primary um, outcomes crossed the line of unity. They were all neutral trials. Well, how about a silver lining that we learned what not to do? And that is to target the nitric oxide cyclic GMP pathway, at least in the ways we were doing so far. Now, where did this idea come across? Well, it was from really, really classic papers. And this is from Walter Paulus's group mainly. Let me just explain it simply. This paper is so beautiful because it actually takes human biopsy samples comparing HEF-REF 
have PEF and then a pure obstructive model of aortic stenosis. Okay, and as you can see, myocardial nitrotyrosine is an indicator of nitrositive stress. So you can see nitrositive stress is highest in HEF-PEF, even higher than HEF-REF, and associated with very low cyclic GMP in the myocardium compared to the both other uh, control uh, comparator conditions. And as a result, the PKG, protein kinase G activity, which is downstream of cyclic GMP, was also reduced. And this leads to fibrosis and different ways that titan is phosphorylated, which can then lead to stiffness of the myocardium. So this was thought, ah, it's, it's the axis to target. So how did we do it? Okay. Well, first, why not give the patients lots of nitrates and inorganic nitrites? Because that's the stuff that causes, um, in the absence of which, means that guanylase cyclists cannot produce cyclic, cyclic GMP. So give the patients more of it, enable more production of cyclic GMP. Why not directly stimulate soluble guanylate cyclase or prevent the breakdown of cyclic GMP by giving phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors. Can you imagine what a great story that would be? Viagra to counteract stiffness. However, none of these trials were positive. Why? Well, I think we only really understood it recently. And this is a very important paper, I think. It's from Joseph Hill's group, published in Nature, where finally there was a small animal model of HEF-PEF that more recapitulates the human situation. So it is a multi-hit model um, so that these patients really have a metabolic inflammatory type of HEF-PEF rather than the transverse aortic constriction model, which frankly is a hypertensive model of heart failure, um, rather than this multi-system HEF-PEF model. And I know that this is very consistent with large animal model work happening here at THI. So this is really exciting. But this showed us really convincingly that systemic inflammation and inos activation, nitrositive stress and so on, really are the drivers of HEF-PEF. And so rather than nitric oxide inducing approaches, we should be focusing on reducing the activation of INOS and perhaps focusing on anti-inflammatory approaches. And, you know, I, I will be glad to elaborate, but there are now very, very interesting molecules in early phase testing of anti-inflammatory approaches. One such is a myeloperoxidase inhibitor um, that is being tested right now in a phase two trial. And there are other very exciting ones coming up, very similar to what is happening in the atherosclerotic world with the interleukin-6 inhibition, for example, with ziltivicumab and so on. So it's a very exciting area. However, in the meantime, please let me catch you up on what I've been doing. And so went back to Singapore, started a observational study across 11 regions in Asia of patients with symptomatic heart failure. And so in the next few slides, can I please share how Asian patients were a little bit different from what I've been seeing so far in the US? First of all, Asian patients with manifest heart failure were strikingly younger. And this really, really pains me because we had patients with HEF-PEF whose average age here would be much older in the 70s and 80s was in the 60s. And in fact, we had a very young HEPF phenotype. And when I say that, I mean people less than 55 years old having, again, symptomatic HEPF. I'm not saying some kind of subclinical or preclinical, no, S presenting already with decompensated symptomatic HEPF. And you know who they were, interestingly? They were obese male. So very different from the hypertensive 
elderly women. So that was interesting. And in case you're thinking, ah, oh, she must have made some kind of wrong diagnosis. This must be just decompensated, deconditioned gentlemen. Well, we compared their outcomes and their echocardiographic characteristics with age match controls in our community. And the death rate in these patients was much higher. And there was absolutely objective evidence of cardiac structural and functional abnormalities in these patients. So it's real, have pet. But the younger patients tend to be obese. Just keep that in your mind. Now, what else did we find now? Yes, we did have some obese-related HEFPEF. But in general, guess what? Asian patients were actually skinnier than the U.S. counterparts. Oh, okay, no one's surprised. But, <laughs> well, when we compared them even to the European counterparts from the Swedish Heart Failure Registry, it's really striking to me that if you compare, regardless of HEFPEF or HEFREF, and co compare the amount of diabetes, we have way more diabetes in our Asian cohorts of heart failure compared to the white patients. And at any given BMI, and you can see our strata go down to less than 20, and they go up to more than 30, we do not have any above 35. That's the range right? Look how much diabetes we have. It's almost 60%. So there is a correlation that with a higher BMI, you get more, but they are all frankly lean. So we call this the lean diabetic phenotype of heart failure. But what I'm getting is when we used machine learning, so this is a technique called clustering, to look for patterns of HEF-PEF among our patients, Three emerged, which I already described. There was the elderly atrial fibrillation cohort. And in our Asian HF, these tended to be, interestingly, patients from Japan and Korea, some of the oldest populations in the world. Then there was the obese metabolic. And you can see Singapore is unfortunately well represented there. And these really, really were similar to what we'd seen described and increasingly more in Olmsted County here in the US. And then there's the lean diabetic, which really was quite unique. And among all three, the ones with the worst prognosis were the lean diabetics. They had a lot of chronic kidney disease. So just, just an interesting another phenotype. But the significance of all of it is it's really opening the door to phenotype-specific treatment. I mean, it cannot be that an elderly hypertensive is treated the exact same way as an obese metabolic, even though the symptoms and manifestation of the syndrome is the same. And in fact, this sort of phenotypic specific approach is an NHLBI research priority now. And if you look at the trends of trials, it is heading that way. We have trials now targeting obesity. That's the summit trial, that's the step -hep -hep trial. And these are with things like the GLP-1 receptor agonist, or the combined GLP-1 -GLP receptor agonist terzepatide. There are trials targeting have PEP patients with inflammation, so with a CRP level above something and so on. So I think we're heading towards that. Okay, but just one last word about the Asian phenotype now. Okay, so in this lean diabetic and all this, this stuff, does the obesity paradox still exist in our Asian patients? So, let, let me first de uh, describe what the obese paradox is. It means that obesity is a risk factor to get heart failure. We know that, right? But when you have heart failure, obesity protects you from outcomes. That's the paradox. And so when we looked at it in Asian HF, we indeed found that obesity defined by body mass index on the x-axis, if you look here on the x-axis, with the probability here is adverse outcome, cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. You can see that as body mass index increase, the risk of adverse outcomes decreases. That's the obese paradox. So guess what? It still exists in Asian heart failure patients. However, if you now change the metric to waist height ratio, have you ever seen anything so opposite? 
the higher the waist height ratio, the higher the risk of an adverse outcome. So this immediately got us thinking, okay, it's, it's got to be something about fat distribution, right? Central adiposity. And currently, there's a lot of work going on in that area. We've got a review coming out in cardiovascular research focusing on this. But to summarize it, the thought process is, first of all, Asian patients may look skinny on the outside, but we could be really fat on the inside. And it's visceral adiposity that seems to matter. And as you can see, it is the patients with the lowest BMI, but the largest waist that do the worst. So it's the kind of lemon on sticks type of appearance, if you can just think about that. But it also made us think, is it visceral adiposity rather than subcutaneous? So is it the fat even close to the heart that could be playing a part? And so we looked at it and we did this by echo as well as by MRI and indeed found that epicardial fat thickness is increased in HEPPEF compared to controls but thinned in HEF-REF compared to controls. And again, I'm sorry, it's quite hard to see, but just notice that in all the graphs, lines are crisscrossing, totally different directions. Well, each line, one is HEF-PEF and one is HEF-REF. And in each of the x-axis, it's increasing epicardial fat thickness. All of it summarizes that there's very divergent roles of these two things in HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. Increasing epicardial fat is associated with more left ventricular dysfunction by echo, more fibrosis by MRI in HEF-PEF, but a completely opposite um, relationship in HEF-REF. Dr. Puglies et al. took it further and looked at outcomes. And here you can see with EAT is epicardial adipose tissue, Please look carefully because you might think these graphs look the same, but they're actually the complete opposite, right? In HEF-PEF, patients who do worse are those with thick epicardial adipose thickness. In HEF-REF, the ones who do worse are the thin, thin epicardial adipose. So this is exactly what we've seen. So th th there's a lot of people writing about this now, but it, it leads us to the hypothesis that excessive epicardial fat, it's not just the quantity, but the quality. And we think that in HEF-PEF, it's likely dysfunctional, secreting some pro-inflammatory factors. Whereas in HEF-REF, it might be playing a physiologic role, maybe like a nutritional source, for example. And so the less you have of it, the worse the, the, the person with HEFREF is doing. So very intriguing, obviously, because it might open the door to therapeutic approaches, which I will now try to elaborate a little bit on. But the hypothesis is it's really, it's been written about by luminaries like Walter Paulus, Karsten Schuh, Milton Packer, the whole idea being a systemic, systemic inflammatory milieu in HEPPEF results in microvascular inflammation affecting throughout the body, but also in the heart. And the epicardial fat is also dysfunctional and inflammatory and may even be a transducer of that inflammatory parts into the heart, into the microvessels. And that in turn leads to downstream increased fibrosis, diastolic dysfunction, and so on. Where is the evidence for that? Well, here's where it's good to have good friends. And so I'm really proud of this study because me, Sanjeev Shah, and Lars Lund, um, we were all sort of fellow fellows at the same time. And we decided, hey, let's get together. And let's prospectively look at microvascular dysfunction in HEPPEF as US, Europe, and Asia. And so we did this in the Promise HEPPEF study, really interesting way of looking at coronary microvascular dysfunction. If you don't mind me elaborating, it's actually by echo. Did you know that you hold the probe in a good enough way, you can actually probe the left anterior descending artery? by echo. So anyway, we did this 
multi-center did it and found that the vast majority of prospectively identified patients with HEPTA had coronary microvascular dysfunction. But very importantly, coronary microvascular dysfunction correlated with evidence of systemic microvascular dysfunction, particularly involving the kidneys. And so it is directly related to urinary albumin creatinine ratio and albuminuria. Now we just bear with me one more data slide because we said, okay, we've seen this, but let's show it again with some fancy proteomics. And so we did these O-link panels and looked at 248 circulating proteins and on the simple story, it's just that we found that circulating proteins indicated inflammation in these patients, but we also showed that they mediated the effect of comorbidity burden and what we were seeing in echoes, the echocardiographic structure and functional abnormalities. So what we're trying to sort of tie up the story in a human cohort that this is really um, evidence supporting that inflammation leads to microvascular dysfunction and leads to the cardiac dysfunction that we see. It's what we, as, as good as we could, <laughs> In, in a prospective study like this. But the final thing is how, how does it impact treatment, right? And so if we identify that as potential treatment, this is what Milton Packer also wrote about that these drugs might inhibit epicardial adipose tissue accumulation and inflammation. And as you can see, there are many of these medications that have or are currently even still being tested. The mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, by the way, are ones you should look out for and coming out very soon. I, I, I suspect in the next few years, um, the SPIRIT trials of spironolactone in pragmatic trials will read out soon. And we now are looking at non-steroidal mineralocorticoid antagonist phenarinone is being tested in a trial called Fine Arts. And if, you, if you're interested, please write to me because there is also evidence that SGLT2 inhibitors directly reduce epicardial fat and epicardial fat inflammation uh, in, in HEPTEP. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice story. It's not the only way SGLT2 inhibitors act, but it's enough for me to tell you a little bit more. And Joe, here's the, here's the family picture of how I was productive in more ways than one <laughs> in the 2010s. 2015, that's that little bugger, my son, Jordan. <laughs> it's also Jordan. But his birth also meant that our second daughter became a middle child. Now, it was um, frankly at a bar uh, in one of those meetings where the most productive conversations occur at the bar that Scott Solomon and I decided, hey, you know what? we should write a piece about the middle child of heart failure. The ones with ejection fraction between 40 and 50%, because at that time, the oldest child have ref, right? Heart failure with ejection fraction less than 40%, got all the awards in terms of all the positive, huge trials. The youngest child, HEPTEF, then defining guidelines as ejection fraction of 50% or more, was getting all the love. And the middle child got nothing. In fact, in guidelines, it was variously called the gray area, the borderline. And well, I'm, I'm just grateful that in 2016, the ESC guidelines, in fact, called it heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction. But notice these guidelines actually grouped treatment recommendations of HEPF and heart failure with mid-range ejection fraction together, saying that we don't know what to do but the guideline writers had a lot of foresight in saying, as new data and analyses become available, it might be possible to make recommendations for each phenotype separately. Now, what this guidelines did though, it, it inspired everyone to look at their databases that contained patients with ejection fraction between 40 and 50%. So when we looked at this retrospectively in trials, we saw the same pattern 
Now, please get used to looking at this graph because I'll show another one later. X-axis is ejection fraction across the entire spectrum of heart failure. Y-axis is treatment effect, where if it's below one, it means benefit of the drug compared to its comparator, like a placebo. So you can see here um, what's highlighted are the 40 to 50% range. And you can see the treatment effect shows benefit in the CHARM program across the ejection fractions from lower through 40 to 50%, but do become attenuated at the higher ejection fraction spectrum. So we're seeing that in CHARM and TopCat for spironolactone with a beta blocker meta-analysis, that same pattern. But it was really in the Paragon trial that this became most, most obvious. Paragon trial was a prospective randomized trial of ARNI compared to Valsartan in patients with HEPPEF. We narrowly missed the primary endpoint. However, what was very clear was there was a striking significant heterogeneity by ejection fraction and sex where it was women and those with an ejection fraction below the median of 50% who appeared to benefit from ARNI. Now that led a lot of people to say, hey, maybe 57% or 60% is the new 40% in naming what is reduced. And I'm not gonna ask you to guess which one of us is the 60 versus 40, but we did look at a sex stratified results in Paragon. And again, these are the same graphs of ejection fraction, the x-axis and rate ratios on the y. You can see that there is benefit in women across the lower ejection fraction up to about 65%, whereas in men, it's about 55%. So maybe even 65 is the new 40 in women, but a bit lower in men, I'm afraid. In case you think it was a fluke in Paragon, when we looked at this in CHARM, in the MRA trials, and of course that was um, Paragon and Paradigm, what you see is the same pattern. Women in red benefit across a wider ejection fraction compared to men. So in women, it attenuates at a higher ejection fraction, which led us to this. If the patients with 40 to 50 or mid-range ejection fraction are benefiting, like those with more reduced ejection fraction, we should just call them heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. So you maintain that acronym of MR, but introduce the term reduced so that clinicians can give these patients a benefit of doubt to treat these patients with the same neurohormonal agents that work in those with more reduced ejection fraction. In this same paper though, we also call for sex specific cutoffs, which means in women, do consider that your elderly patient with an ejection fraction of 55%, who's a woman, already has a reduced ejection fraction. And it makes sense because if you look at community-based data and normal data of echo um, parameters in women and men, you'll notice that ejection fraction increases with age in healthy populations and is always higher at any given age in women than men. Why? Because ejection fraction is just a fraction and women are smaller. So our denominator, which is the end diastolic volume is smaller. I hope we have the same stroke volume because if not, I might be keeling over if my stroke volume is also that low. And so with the same stroke volume and a smaller denominator, my ejection fraction is going to be higher than Joe's. If we have the same ejection fraction, there might be something wrong with me. Do you see? So if, if we don't use sex-specific cutoffs, we might be depriving many more women from therapies that could potentially work. I feel very strongly about this. Um, so thank you for letting me elaborate for a while before we enter the 2020s. Boy, we entered it with a bang. 
We had the first FDA approved treatment for at least some patients with Hep Pef in the ARNI. We finally welcomed a new guideline that indeed called it heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction and included as 2B considerations the same neurohormonal agents that we, that we talk about in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. I'd like to show that the American guidelines were perfectly consistent. However, you will note a very um, interesting difference is that the American guidelines included as a 2A recommendation the SGLT2 inhibitors and did this recommendation not only for heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction, but also for heart failure with pre pre preserved ejection fraction. And that's because the ESC guidelines were published before the Emperor Preserve results came out and the American uh, guidelines were published right after. Notice that in HEF-PEF, there's an asterisk in the demarcation for RNA, MRA, or ARB, where it says greater benefits in patients with EF closer to 50%. So that is accounting for those splines that you keep seeing, that you may get benefit up to 60, you know, it doesn't say it, it just says more benefit if it's lower and closer to 50. But I'm just thrilled to be standing here to now say this is like, I've been waiting my entire career to say that we've got an actual treatment <laughs> for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And now we have not just one, but two robustly positive outcomes trials in HEPPEF. And they are both with the SGLT2 inhibitors. One is dapagliflozin in the deliver trial, and one is empagliflozin in the emperor preserved trial. And as you can see with the combined endpoints of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, there's a 20% relative risk reduction. If we look at cardiovascular death, there appears to be a 12% trend in that direction. And it's, I think beauty is in the eye of the beholder, whether a 0.052 you're going to take as evidence of benefit or not. And we'll see how the, evidence, um, the guideline writers take that. But for me, I mean, it's pretty consistent that there's at least a trend towards benefit. And then of course, a market reduction in heart failure hospitalizations. This has led Scott and I to write this, this other piece that my goodness, have we reached a stage where we now have therapies that work across the entire range of ejection fraction? And yes, I believe so. But maybe we should not be that surprised because we do also treat the fundamental congestive state of heart failure with diuretics, for example, or the fundamental states of skeletal muscle deconditioning with rehabilitation. So there are things that we do regardless of the ejection fraction. And we believe the SGLT2 inhibitors fall there. And then for those with evidence of left ventricular remodeling, mostly evidenced by a reduced ejection fraction below normal, whatever normal is, which is higher for women, then please consider the neurohormonal blockers. And so just to end, uh, what will we be doing next? Well, here are my five predictions. I think first we will continue to grapple with nomenclature. You heard me already emphasize heart failure with normal ejection fraction. I think we should just be going reduced and normal. Reduced could be mildly or frankly reduced. And normal should be defined with sex specific cutoffs, please. We will be looking for treatable mimickers. So this is very important. Treatable mimickers, cardiac amyloidosis, pericardial constriction, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathies, because there are specific treatments that could cure these patients. We still will be trying to understand the patients with a higher ejection fraction, the ones that seem to have attenuated response and everything else. And well, I think there's a lot of hope with this multimodality profiling. Um, I know that there are plans to do that here in THI. I'm so excited that you will be looking at that at least in the cardiogenic shock, or in the stage D heart failures, but hopefully in time, 
also have a database because I think this is very, very powerful and the way to go where it's proteomics and image, if I may call image genomics, to try to understand the different patterns. Now, I, I hate to geek out here, but this is something that we have um, submitted. And, and I thought for this audience, you might want to see what, I, what we've been thinking. So this is image genomics simplified that, that we tried to do in Asian HF. We tried to look at patients with heart failure with normal ejection fraction and split them up and, and try to get machine learning to see if there are different patterns. And we believe this is what we're seeing. If this is the pressure volume relationship of a control, this shift where everything shifted steeper is that older hypertensive. We think that this is what's happening with that younger obese that it's, it's actually volume expansion in those patients, and that's what we should be looking at. Now, we will continue to test new therapies. I've already mentioned some of the medical therapies, but would also like to mention devices that I think are really cool. I mean, we're starting, you know, we, we've been testing, creating an atrial shunt between the left and right atrium to actually offload the atrial hypertension in HEFPEF. And I think there's a lot of, of potential for splanchnic nerve uh, modulation. Uh, this, especially in the obese HEPPEF, where perhaps increasing the venous capacitance so that the volume distribution um, uh, helps these patients. And those with volume overload, in other words, I think th that, that holds a lot of promise. And finally, of course, we will find ways to facilitate the HEPPEF diagnosis now that we have an effective treatment. And this is one such example. Thank you, Jordan, for mentioning it a little bit earlier. But this is using AI, for example, to help even um, GPs, for example, make the diagnosis of HEPPEF, where it's point of care echo, where you have AI to guide the acquisition, and you have a full report immediately produced with telling you, putting all those scores and guidelines together, saying it's a high probability of HEPPEF, all of which is to identify the right patient at the right time for the right treatment. So thank you very much for letting me share this story. And I'm, I'm just really, really thrilled to be here. And thank you very much for your attention.